How's it going Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm going to be in Austin, Texas soon and I'm going to be hanging out with a bunch of industry professionals and uh, super fans of whiskey and all things distilled. I decided to ask you guys a little while what questions you would ask them. So today I'm going to run through some of those questions I'm going to ask and I'm going to answer them myself as well. Welcome to Still It everyone, I'm Jesse and this is the channel all about chasing the craft of home distillation and making it a legitimate hobby. Alright team, a little while ago I reached out to you guys and asked, you know, what questions would you ask if you got half an hour with a pro distiller with uh, someone in the whiskey, gin, whatever industry and you were able to pick their brain or kind of, you know, even challenge the industry a little bit. I know that was a long time ago guys and nothing's happened of it yet, but I promise you I have been thinking about it, I have been looking through your answers because they were pretty freaking spot on. So I thought what I would do is I'm going to run through the questions that I'd like to you know, throw into interviews with these people on the spot and uh, I also thought what I would do is answer those questions for two reasons. I think in some instances my answers might be a little bit different than what you think I might say. But I also thought it might be kind of fun to see if my ideas on some of these topics or my uh, understanding of how things works change between now and the end of the trip. Alright, let's get stuck in. The first and probably quite an obvious question that a bunch of people suggest that I ask, why did you start chasing the craft in the first place? Like I said, a bunch of people suggested this, but Marty from Patreon was the first one in. So you get credit for this one, dude. So for me, why did I start chasing the craft? I, I don't know if I've ever really told this story on the channel, but basically I was in a, in a job that used to be really cool and then just kind of died. I lost all creative output, I lost any sort of real feeling that it was going to go anywhere. We had a young child as well, our first child was young, so I kind of felt trapped. I felt like I couldn't leave my job, but I wanted to start doing something. That's sort of where the idea of whether or not I should start a YouTube channel came around, that sounded like something that could satiate my geekery but also potentially lead to something that might be worth something in the future, it might be something that could support our family, it might be something that would get me out of that job that was you know basically a dead end job. On the other hand I had always craved the ability to mess around with spirits, I'd always craved being able to play with spirits not be super precious about spirits, to you know use a little in cooking if I wanted to, to be able to geek out with them and try different things, mix different cocktails, try this spirit next to that spirit, you know just, just have fun with it and take it a lot less seriously. Unfortunately you know I really wasn't <laughs> making great money, we just bought a house, we had a young kid, spirits are freaking expensive in New Zealand and um, I just couldn't justify spending my money on on spirits, so I didn't get to do that. So these two ideas sort of came together and that's where we are today. And in addition to that, in the background, I just have this love and passion, god that sounds cheesy, but it's true, for learning things, for, for progressing in something and feeling like I'm aiming towards a mastery, even though I know that I'd never actually get there, the fact that I could be better at something tomorrow than I am the day before. So those three things put together why I chased the craft and why I started chasing the craft and honestly and honestly that uh, that reason really hasn't changed other than now I get to do it with you guys as well which I never realized how freaking cool that would be to, to, to share this stuff with people across the globe it's it's awesome so thank you guys. Another common thread or a common another common theme was the idea of yeast and how how much using different yeasts could affect the final products that we make in distilling and to be honest guys, I can't speak with a whole lot of authority on this because I have yes, yet to actually do side by side you know, experiments with it. In saying that, I have to believe, unless I run a side by side test of say Turbo, USO5, you know, one of the whiskey yeasts and a dirty great banana bomb Belgian yeast and they're like, I can't taste any difference, like until that happens the deep down inside me I just can't believe that it won't make a dis difference. Sure some of the esters will probably 
you know, maybe get left behind on the boiler. Some of them might volatize off, you know, way early in the run. Um, some of them may make it through to the jar but not stay in the jar. Whatever, you know, like I can, I can totally see different paths for it making less of an impact than I could expect. But I have to believe that some of that flavor and uh, just the essence of the yeast that's used is going to make it through to the fin finished product. Now, just note, guys, I'm not talking about yeastiness. I'm not talking about, you know, the subway smell. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about all the different flavors that yeast can impart onto a spirit. But like I said, I'm open to the facts that if it's shown to me that that's not the case, then I'll uh, change tact. And of course, you know, until I can have some sort of data in front of me, I don't want to go and push my ideas on other people. Once again, over on Patreon, Pirate Pete had a really good uh, question. He sort of said, how did you get your start in the industry? That obviously is directed at people that are not me. <laughs> I don't have a start in the industry, although although I kind of really hope that still it might turn into something in the future. Whether that be production of spirits, yeah, I'm not so excited about that. Whether it be some sort of collaboration with craft distillers, or I don't know what it's going to be, but maybe I'll get there one day, and uh, if I do, <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> well, I guess you all know it's all on film, so. But it's going to be a damn good question to ask uh, the professional distillers and I think the marketers and those sort of things too, because I know a lot of you guys would like to get, you know, the, the, the pipe dream is to get into the industry one day, right? Also, also to add to that, there's a bit of a sidecast question there, which is, you know, how did you manage to amass enough knowledge to get started? And then how did you, once you were started, amass the next lot of knowledge to get to the point where you were, you know, actually a meaningful contributor to the industry. And uh, once again, I think that's going to be a super interesting, very, very interesting question. Uh, I think, like most of you guys, for me, a little bit of books and reading and that sort of thing, um, random papers with, you know, Google Scholar and stuff like that, a whole lot of time in the forums, and then a whole lot of time trying to sort of vet what the forums say to decide whether or not I subscribe to that thought process or not. Other YouTube channels that are doing things in the industry, you know, um, The Whiskey Tribe, Barley and Hops, Bearded and Bored, Cask Strength, there's a, a whole list of them. I'll, maybe I'll do another a video on that sometime, guys. Uh, and then obviously just some experience in, in trying it out as well. Randall, who's a Patreon and also a mod on the Facebook page, asked, what do commercial distilleries do? Like, let's get the actual, <laughs> the actual, from the horse's mouth answer with what they do on faints and then to break that down on what they what they uh, class faints as. Do they have four shots, heads, hearts, tails? Do they just have heads, hearts, tails? What do they keep? What do they do with it? So on and so forth. All right, so what do I do? I generally take a small portion of the heads and just biff them. I, to be honest, I, People have gotten grumpy at me for saying this before, but I don't see, I don't see the huge benefit in making a really big distinction between four shots and heads. Now, I think the reason that people have had an issue with me saying that in the past is I think that they think that I'm saying that four shots don't matter. Just drink the things. It, it's whatever. It's not, it's not an issue. Let me clarify. <laughs> okay. I, when I say I don't think methanol or four shots are a big issue, it's because A, we're really not producing that much of it, and the only way you're really going to get into trouble is if you take just the four shots in certain situations only and, and drink just those, right, with nothing else. Yes, I agree that you could potentially get into trouble like that. The reason that I don't really think it's an issue, let me tell you what I think I've said every time, and... Um, if people have misconstrued it, then that's on them. If I wasn't clear enough, that's on me. But let me say it again right now. I don't think it's a big deal if you are making good cuts and making cuts based on quality, right? And the reason I say that is that, forget about the four shots, whatever. It's a hunt, like, if you want to subscribe to 100 mils at the beginning, that's cool. Like, at the, at the beginning of the run, I'm not going to use the first four liters of it. Why do I have to stress about the first 100 mils? Just taste until it, you know, taste from the hearts back up towards the heads. And when you hit something that doesn't taste great, stop using it. And that's going to be a much bigger cut than just the four shots. So then, yes, I keep those heads. I keep them. 
and I will put them into faints to be rerun next time. Ah, but, ah, they will say, but you're, what about the four shots? You're going to reuse those. Dude, whatever, like 100 mils, 500 mils, a liter, whatever. I can chuck that and not have to worry about it, right? I think it's semantics that people don't like when I say it that way. They like the hard and fast rule of take X amount of milliliters per liters or X amount of ounces per quarts or whatever. If that's you, dude, and you need to follow like something strict, that's cool. But you have to understand, but you have to understand that that rule is going to sometimes be grossly overcompensating and sometimes be grossly undercompensating, I have to assume, based on what you're running, how, you know, and how good your still is at separating everything, so on and so forth. Cool. My bit done on heads and four shots. Tails, yep, I keep everything. Generally, cuts I make, depending on what I'm making, if it's, you know, a pot still run or run down to 40 and 50, 35 to 50%. Uh, so what's that? 70 to 100 proof, somewhere in that range. And then I'll run from that point as low as I can be bothered running, you know, depending on how lazy I'm feeling that night. But I generally, I generally try to aim to get down to 20%. And then uh, from sort of 20% to 10% is my how lazy am I feeling tonight sort of range. So everything from 10% or 20% up to, you know, 35 to 50%, somewhere in that quite wide range. I'll keep that, put it aside, and then use that for something else. Greg had an awesome question that sort of follows on for this. What do commercial distillers do when it comes to making cuts? Do they actually, you know, cut out a run and decide what they're going to keep and what they're not going to keep? Do they literally just come down to a certain point, you know, boom, we've hit 80%, cool, we're keeping everything, and we've hit 48%, we're not keeping anything else. What do they do? Do they sort of selectively choose what's going into barrels? Do they just throw it all into barrels and decide what to do later? I think that's a really cool question to ask people, because once again, it's one of these things that is much more, in my opinion, I think, more of a home distilling thing than a, than a commercial thing. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that there's a misconception that they don't make any cuts at all. If they're using a continuous still, however, they kind of can do that on the fly, right? Like they've got 20 plates or something to choose from and it's pretty much the same thing as making cuts at the end of the day. Um, second is, I know it's not a popular opinion in the craft world, um, but at the end of the day, the money's got to work, right? And if it takes you far too long to do things, um, that's one run a day instead of two runs a day, when all those things add up, you've got to be commercially viable to be commercial. If you don't care at all about the money and you just want to make the very, very, very best product, you need to be one of two things. You need to be insanely expensive or you need to be a hobbyist. Just my opinion, uh, I'm very interested to see what the actual distillers and industry people say on this one. Mark wanted to know, and this is a very, very good question, I think, to ask people that run big ass stills. Uh, do, do the sort of recipes that we're making on, you know, the home distilling equipment, 10 to 200 litre stills, do they scale the same based on percentage? Or do you have to be constantly messing with things um, as you scale up to a larger size. I think that's a super interesting concept and I get the feeling it's going to be a whole lot more complex than um, might meet the eye. And the reason I say that is if you think about something like uh, brewing, for example, it's probably the closest hobby that I can think of with solid examples of this. There's just things that happen that mean recipes don't scale. For example, if you're putting hops into beer, just super crash course, guys. Hops that have been boiled for a long time, you know, an hour or something like that, have very little flavor, very little aroma, and a buttload of bitterness. Way on the other end, if you go, um, you know, like flame out hops or even dry hops and that, you know, just cold in the fermenter hops, they do the opposite, right? Like not a lot of bitterness, a whole lot of flavor, a whole lot of aroma. Home brewers will add hops in at flame out. So they do an hour boil, they turn the flame out, they throw the hops in and it takes, you know, maybe depending on your groundwater and your type of chiller, five minutes to 20 minutes to chill your wort down. Cool. So you've, you know, you've had tapering off temperature, which acts on it as well, with a fairly short amount of time. A big commercial brewery, <laughs> they are not going to be able to chill a metric shit ton of wort in 20 minutes. So a flame out addition is a very different thing in a commercial brewery compared to a home brewery. There is a whole host of things like this that affect the beer world between commercial and um, home brewing. And I have to assume that it's going to be the same sort of stuff in home distilling too. Who knows? 
Daniel asked, how do they deal with, you know, those giant ass all grain brews not puking? And uh, that's interesting to me because, yeah, man, when you think about that much wort in one place, <laughs> yeah, that's especially for stuff like rum and uh, whiskey. Woo, that's, uh, yeah, that's an issue. I'd love to know how the pros do it, so I'm definitely going to be asking that question to at least a couple of people. Personally, um, have two approaches. One is just chill, don't fill your boiler so much, do a couple of stripping runs and then do a real run, or, you know, just don't fill the boiler so much. Uh, two is use something that is going to kill the bubbles, essentially, and uh, you can use, you know, a conditioner and stuff like that. I use butter. All right, team, so those are the questions the Patreons put forward. And a damn fine job they did too. I think they're great questions that I'll definitely be pulling from to ask people. And you guys know that I uh, totally appreciate the Patreons for more than the, more than the questions. I gotta say a huge thank you to these people. Uh, still, it literally would not be here without them anymore, guys. I would have given up when the twins turned up, honestly, um, if I didn't have, you know, these people to, to not let down. So thank you very much to the Patreons. All right, team, and they are not the only questions I'm going to be asking people, but are uh, definitely going to be some of the go-to ones. So I'll be doing another little video similar to this one with the questions that came from the Facebook group. All right, team, that's me for today. So if you like the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. If you really like it, hit subscribe down below. I'll catch you next time, guys. Keep on chasing the craft. See ya.